uh, to this um, this lecture or, or presentation. Um, I want to give a little bit of a background on uh, Dave. So <clears throat> I actually know Dave through uh, through Rotary, the Rotary Club of Dundas. And we've been having a conversation about um, Jewish ancestry for about a year and a bit. So I'm going to give Dave's bio first, and then I'm going to share a little bit more about why I'm excited to bring this presentation to you from Hamilton Jewish Family Services. So Dave and his wife Sue were born in the UK, he was recruited by Bell Canada, arriving in minus 20 degrees of Celsius weather on December 28th, 1976, Canada. His two daughters were born in Canada afterwards, and then his family spent five years in Saudi Arabia working on Bell's contracts. Dave retired in 2010 after his career with Bell and consulting in the, with the consulting company CGI. Since then, he has worked with the Dundas Valley Sunrise Rotary Club, Transition Dundas, Environment Hamilton, Hamilton 350, and Hamilton's Mustard Seed Cooperative. And also, I believe, Environment Hamilton. He works to raise awareness of the need for action on climate change, food security, and local resilience. He's not optimistic on our ability to solve these issues, but he is hopeful. Now, I, I wanna say I met Dave through Rotary and we had a really interesting conversation about our own respective heritages. And it wasn't until, and David told me a little bit about his story, but it wasn't until November 11th of this year when our Rotary Club had a presentation of honoring war vets. And Dave spoke about his father's story and he shared images of his father. And I was blown away. And I immediately sent Dave an email and I said, Dave, I really want you to talk to Hamilton Jewish Family Services about this. Because at our agency, everyone has a story and these stories make us who we are. And we carry, I believe, our ancestors within us. They make us who, who we are as people. And so Dave had a really interesting conversation and he said, yes, I'm willing to do this presentation. And um, I'm really glad he's able to do it and he's willing to do it. And I also wanted to thank you all for being here tonight. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. I'm gonna keep you muted for the presentation. And if you have questions, we'll save them to the end. But um, uh, welcome to One Family's Diaspora. And, and here's Dave Carson, who will be leading the, the, the presentation. This is his family story. Well, hello, everybody. This is just one family's story. One part of my family. Um, I'm going to, I've, I have actually written this out so I can speak concisely. And so at the end, if you want a copy of these notes or these pictures, I'm more than happy to send them to you through whoever, through whoever you connected with. So <clears throat> here we go. I hope the slides are clear. I'm on a not very strong internet link. So sometimes if it does freeze, it takes a moment to come back, uh, but please be patient. And this should take about 45 minutes, my little chat. So, I think growing up for most of us, the, our parents are the, and the, are the people who care for, for us and we rely on them for everything. And granny and grandpa and uncle and aunts are people who visit and sometimes spoil us. And you might hear a little bit about their lives but mostly you're just happy to be visited or visiting with them. Gradually, you may hear some interesting stories as you grow up, but also learn there are some topics that are never discussed. And so it was with me. I knew my father was German and Jewish by birth. He'd had an accident in the war, but not much more information. And we loved our holiday get togethers with our grandparents, uncles and aunts. But as a schoolboy in the late 1950s, I was reluctant to talk about having a German father. The war had just ended 15 years ago. That's the same time as the US invasion of Iraq, if you just think back 15 years, it's not long. And it was even more difficult for me as I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, went to a Catholic school. So being part Jewish was not something talked of at school. Gradually, I understood I had a history though, one that I could be proud of, and I hope some of that pride comes through today. I can't take credit for it, but my parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents 
were people who navigated the great upheaval of the 20th century relatively successfully. There's a book entitled Hitler's Gift. I don't know if some of you have read it. You can see Albert Einstein in the middle of the front row there. And this describes the talented people that left Germany and Germany lost them due to Nazism. And one of them wrote that far from destroying the spirit of German scholarship, the Nazis spread it all over the world. Only Germany was the loser. My family aren't in the book, but they surely represent some of that gift to other countries, university professors, lecturers, teachers, and so on. This is a story of one branch of my family, the Myers of Mainz, a town on the Rhine near Frankfurt. It's based on letters and interviews documented by various family members. And some of the photos I'll show you are a bit blurred as they're blow ups of old ones. And in other cases, I don't have photos, but I'll just talk about the people. So to help you follow the characters in this story, let me introduce them. It starts with my great grandmother, Friederike Meyer, or Frieda Meyer, as we call her on the left there, and her brother, Bernhard. I didn't know them either. They both survived the war and died shortly thereafter. I'm told Frieda knew I was on the way, but died before I was born. My brother, Edward, doesn't figure in this story. He died in 1899, quite young, as far as I know, without any offspring. The main characters in the story, though, are their children and grandchildren shown here and their escape from Nazi Germany. For some, it was a dramatic escape and for others, a departure of foresight. But for all of them, it changed their way of life, their careers, their language and their nationality. Great grandmother Frieda married Edward Posen, a member of the distinguished family of leather manufacturers from Offenbach, a neighboring town near to Mainz. And you can still buy Edward Posen leather goods, but our family are no longer involved with them. Frieda and Edward had two children, my grandmother Elizabeth and her brother Carl. Edward died in 1916, the same year this picture was taken on their 25th wedding anniversary. But he gave Frieda something very valuable, a piece of paper. It was her Swiss citizenship, which enabled Frieda and her son Carl to live out the war in Switzerland, where she died in 1946. Son Carl doesn't figure any more in this story that he remained in Switzerland, ran a publishing business and died in 1970. My grandmother Elizabeth's story was very different. Here she is. She was a very cultured woman, a pianist, a singer with a love of literature. She'd been to Rodin, a girls' public school in England, but university for a girl in those days was out of the question. However, her beautiful singing voice led her to leave home for Berlin, where she stunned under the wife of Arthur Schnabel, then Germany's greatest pianist. But the outbreak of war and marriage intervened before she could give her first public performance. She had a first marriage to Wolfgang Wachschmuth, which produced uh, daughter Dorothy, but they divorced shortly afterwards. And in 1919, she married my grandfather, Alfred Kalbach, a Berlin lawyer and a keen amateur photographer. They'd known each other a long time. On the left, here's a photograph of them in amateur theatrical dress, and another from World War I, Officer Kalbach directing his gun crew. He's the man that's doing the pointing in the picture. And in October 1919, 10 months after they had married, my father Andrew was born. Here are, are pictures of what was apparently a very happy family life in the 20s and early 30s. The top two are with Elizabeth, Alfred, and their two children, my father and his sister, Dorothy. And in the bottom left is Aunt Frieda, my great grandmother, uh, with her three grandchildren, the third boy being Peter, the son of Elizabeth's brother, Carl Posen. This is a well to do family. Summers were spent at Grundlsee, a lakeside resort in Austria, where they mixed with society friends. At home, dad remembers when guests came, 
they used to dress up for dinner, dinner jackets and long dresses. Alfred had a law practice. Two notable German figures who worked with him in his law practice at various times. One was Helmut von Moltke, a foreign service diplomat who was a leader in the resistance against Hitler. And he was sadly executed by the Nazis in January, 1945. Another was Eric koch former Minister of Justice and Vice-Chancellor to Germany, who survived by emigrating to Brazil. On April the 1st, 1933, the Nazis instituted the national boycott of Jewish establishments. And seven days later, the law of admission to the bar was passed, which prohibited most Jewish lawyers from practicing. It did have a veterans clause, which initially exempted those who'd fought at the front in World War I, as my grandfather had, but not for long. In this picture, you can see the warning. Warning labels are attached to the nameplates of Jewish lawyers. By May 1935, Elizabeth had found a boarding school in England for my father. And dad recalled they went over on a very posh American liner, the SS Washington, from Hamburg to Southampton to join Sutton Valence in school in Kent. Elizabeth was the prime mover in the family for, for emigration, recognizing the dangers early from Hitler's Nazis. And in September 1936, with Alfred being unable to practice law and Elizabeth pressing the rest of the family, including daughter Susanna, a late addition to the family born in 1933, all moved to England. High Nazi wealth taxes were imposed on immigration and without work in their profession, their way of life changed dramatically once in the UK. Eventually the stress caused a breakup of the marriage and I grew up not knowing my grandfather. But more on my father's story. At Sutton Valence School, he spent a happy three years and here he is in 1937, 17 years old, having just passed out as an officer cadet and I wrote to the school recently, and their archive shows he was also a keen sportsman, getting school colors in both rugby and soccer. After passing, passing school matriculation at age 18, he joined Lions Tea as a trainee tea taster, an unusual profession. And here's some irony. You can see it at the bottom of this page. The wording on his officer training certificate tells him to report for duty at the outbreak of war. The reality was a little different. Instead, he was classified as an enemy alien. His movement was restricted. And then with the invasion of France in 1940, this 20 year old Jewish refugee, now an English public schoolboy, was arrested and interned as was his father, Alfred. A month later, he became part of a notorious shipment of Germans to Australia on the SS Dunera. Captured prisoners of war, hardened Nazis and Jewish refugees all mixed together. This is how the trip was described in a book written by one internee. Nothing else which occurred during the internment period remotely touches the stark, almost unreal horror of the journey of His Majesty's troop ship Danera from Liverpool to Fremantle, Melbourne and Sydney from the 10th of July to the 7th of September, 1940, almost two months. Dunera was an old troop ship built to take a maximum of 2,000 people, but there were almost 2,800 on board. For almost two months en route, they were bullied and ill-treated by British soldiers, many of their few possessions being stolen or destroyed. And the major in, afterwards, the major in charge and two others were later court-martialed for this mistreatment. Now, not part of the Maya story, but also on the ship, was 19-year-old Gangolf Herman, the father of my cousin Gavin, who lives in Mississauga. Gavin's on this call. Gangolf and my father were unrelated at this time because Gangolf was later to marry my father's cousin. And as the Hermans were on the estranged grandfather's side of the family, we didn't know each other's, of each other's existence until a long chain of coincidence introduced us to each other in 1995. In classic prisoner fashion, numbered postcards were sent home with requests for money and clothing while dad spent almost a year in the prisoner of war camp at Hay, New South Wales. 
Meanwhile, his mother, a very determined woman, campaigned for his release. MPs heard a lot from her, and Andrew was one of the first to return from Australia in August 1942. Sorry, 41. 14 ex POWs traveled with him on a freighter, and he recalled that they came through the Panama Canal. We bought a banana tree in West Africa, and it hung right in the middle of our little cabin. His father was released from internment on the Isle of Man at the same time. On that return, he signed up at the recruiting office and was called up to the Pioneer Corps, a sort of labor battalion, where he spent over a year before being called for an interview to join a special group of commandos. These were German and Austrian refugees who were to be given special training. He wasn't sure why he was called up, but he thinks it was someone passed on his name who'd been on the in Australia with him. As commando training was very rigorous and specialized, one author wrote, by the standards of the commandos, his troop was a particularly extraordinary bunch. As well as having normal skills of all commandos in explosives, parachuting, and so on, they had high intelligence and education, were indeed by far the most highly trained group in the British Army, especially in field craft, camouflage, compass marching, street fighting, house breaking, and lock picking. Imagine having a father who's expert at lock picking and house breaking. He never talked about it. All these commandos were required to anglicize their names as it was feared they would be killed if captured by the Nazis. And so my dad became Andrew Carson, the name I now bear. Here he is in uniform and on a training climb with his troop, as always with a pipe in his mouth. The dad never made it to the front line. In March 1944, while abseiling down a cliff in training, the rope got jammed, he cut himself free and fell 90 feet. Many broken bones later, weeks in hospital and plastic surgery resulted. But this accident may have been a blessing in disguise, for of the 88 soldiers who served in his special troop, 21 were killed in action. One of my dad's commando troop, Tony Firth, lived in post-war Toronto, and when we would visit him, my parents came for holidays with us. I asked him once if he'd been present when dad had had his accident. His reply, was I present? I was holding the bloody rope. Happily for dad, just before his accident, he'd met a beautiful young, young women's auxiliary Air Force radar operator, Dean Gidlow. It must have been awful to see her boyfriend so severely injured, but it was no deterrent to the relationship. Dad said the romance blossomed when he was in hospital, and they were married in December 1944 when he was on sick leave. You might even see on the wedding photograph, Dad's forehead was still bandaged. And the bridesmaid was his 11-year-old sister, Susanna. As a result of these injuries, Dad was discharged and went back to work with lions, and not long after, Mum was pregnant with my elder brother, Nicholas, so was also discharged. One interesting afterward, because Mum had married a subject of a state at war with His Majesty, she lost her British citizenship and had to reapply to become naturalized British again. It took another year after that for my father to gain the same privilege. Dad was now a true Brit and rarely spoke of his youth in Germany. We did visit on holiday once in 1952, but that was all. And after he died in 2004, when my brother read his eulogy, people were surprised to hear that this true blue English public schoolboy was actually born and brought up in Germany. My grandparents, Elizabeth and Alfred, remained in England, as did daughters Dorothy and Susanna. Alfred went from a to a successful professional photographer and became a member of the Royal Photographic Society. One of his commissions was to photograph the King's collection of Leonardo cartoons at Windsor Castle, and I have a book of that in my possession. Alfred died in 1974. Elizabeth, the matriarch of the family, continued her life of music and literature, also teaching music and German, and took her A-levels at the age of 64. I remember being taken to my headmaster's study to listen to her being interviewed on the radio, because a 64-year-old taking A-levels was, not, was most unusual in 1956. She died age 100 in 1992. Daughter Susanna, my dear aunt, is now aged 87 and lives in Reading. And her daughter Dorothy 
much loved by everyone, sadly died of cancer in 1948, just after the birth of her daughter, Monica. So that's how my great grandmother, Frida, and her children survived the war and ended up far from Mainz. Her brother, Bernard Meyer, was, a, was part of a successful family, uh, successful jewelry manufacturers living in Mainz. The company founded by Bernard's grandfather, Martin Meyer, still for Martin's name. Here's an advertisement from a New York magazine in the late 19th century. My great uncle Bernard married Adele Trier, the daughter of an iron and steel merchant from Darmstadt. This picture, taken in 1915, is Bernard with his, four, his wife, Adele, and his four children, Ernst, Liesel, Martin, and Carl. It's wartime, 1915, and Bernard's two eldest children, you can see them, Ernst second left and Carl second right, are in their uniforms. Like many German Jews, they fought for their country in World War I, something that gave many of them misplaced confidence they would not be harmed with the rise of the Nazis. As I'm going to tell you, all the Myers in this picture survived the war. But sadly, other family members here, Bernard's sister-in-law, her husband, died with their daughter in Theresienstadt. I have a document dictated by Bernard in 1943, Memories of the Jewish Communities in Mainz, and it spans the period that he was president of the Jewish community. Under his leadership of the community of nearly 3,000, this great synagogue was built. The opening in 1912 was a milestone for reformed Jews in Mainz. The beautiful dome building was intended to serve the needs of members of the liberal Jewish community who'd left their historical quarter in the old city and move west as the city grew. Its inauguration was a grand event attended by the leaders of the state, city authorities, as well as the clergy and signifying both his secular and religious influence upon the opening, Bernard Albert was awarded the Knight's Cross First Class of the Grand Ducal Hessian Order of Philip the Magnanimous. That's a grand title. Then in the Nazi era, Bernard led the Jewish community of Mainz through the increasingly oppressive times as the living conditions became more and more difficult for them. The synagogue took on a new role, providing space for the Jewish school, that moved in as Jewish children were excluded from public schools and also hosted the soup kitchen to feed the needy. Sadly, this beautiful synagogue he was instrumental in building was destroyed on Kristallnacht. But as a community leader, Bernard seems to have had some level of protection as things got worse. His son recounted, on Kristallnacht they came to arrest my father. They came to the flat, and my mother opened the door, and when they wanted to go in, one of the SS... Sorry? Someone's talking about One of the SS leaders from Mainz, who knew me very well, came and said they should stay away from my father. And they did. Bernard and Adele's escape was a close thing. His son recorded, in April 1941, my father was warned by his contacts in the Gestapo in Mainz to leave if he could. And then Bernard writes in his own words, on the morning of the 24th of March, 1941, I began my journey of emigration. First to Berlin, where the train had to be boarded. And this train carried a thousand prominent Jews to Bilbao, only those who had visas to go to South America or anywhere else. And so from Bilbao, they made it to Argentina. And Bernard ends his document with, for the first time, since long before the present history, there are no Jews in Mainz or Rheinhessen, and it will not be very different over the rest of Germany. Adele died in, in Buenos Aires in 1945 and Bernard in 1947. But his, he, he left behind four children and I'm going to just describe their, their stories too. These again are World War I portraits given the uniforms. In the upper picture are all four, the lower just three boys. Ernst on the left, Karl on the right, and young Martin in the middle. 
the two elder sons emigrated at different times in the Nazi period. And first of all, let's look at Ernst. Here's a prosperous looking Ernst and his wife Ermgard in 1929, still in Germany. He did his PhD in Berlin and left for America in 1936. And Ermgard and their son, nine-year-old Stefan, had a very difficult time, were only able to join him in 1938. Their escape was perilous, going first to the Netherlands and then to England to finally catch up the boat to the US. Ernst worked with uh, one of the big steel merchants in Chicago and stayed with them till his retirement and died in 1964. And only recently have I been in touch with his granddaughter, Stephanie, who actually sent me these two photographs today. And I'm hoping to learn more of the family's experience from, from them. Ernst must have been a lovely man. My grandmother wrote this about him. I can't write any sort of memoirs without mentioning Uncle Adele's second son, Ernst, our dear Ernie five years younger than I, who was, was and remained a most faithful friend throughout his life. He had cancer in his 50s, but was able a few years later to travel from Chicago to Europe. And he stayed with us uh, for two days. We were talking of our childhood days, feeling as near to each other as we always did. And six months later, this kindest of men was dead. And here he is in this picture with his grandchildren, Stephanie, who's on the call. And Alex, I don't know if you're there too about 1962. His elder brother, Carl, uh, story was told to me by his son as follows. His son, also named Bernard. Carl had been a decorated soldier in World War I, heavily hurt, declared unfit for further military duties. He was consul general representing Persia in Germany for about 10 years, but had problems with his business in, 19, in 1931 um, in, starting in 1931, and he left in 1933, trying to build up a future elsewhere, which he finally managed to do in 1936 in Argentina. And that's where Carr remained until he died in 1976. But his two, Carl had two children shown here, Bernard and Klaus, and they had very different experiences. Carl's wife, Emmy, a single mother in Germany after Carl left in 1933, was Catholic. Their children as Michelings initially did not face as much difficulty. The eldest of the two named Bernard after his grandfather wrote to me that he'd volunteered for the army in the cavalry regiment, which his father had served for in that World War I. He said then World War, the war broke out and we were sent to Poland. These are all uh, Bernard's words. It was a short but bloody affair. And then late in 1940, I was called to my battalion commander who told me he'd received orders from the high command to release me on orders from the German Foreign Affairs Ministry on the request of the Argentine government. I know this story sounds incredible, but there it was. I went to language school in Leipzig for three months to learn Spanish. I asked the Gestapo for my passport and obtained it without problem, to which they added the permission to travel via Spain. And I flew from Stuttgart to Madrid. And then after some trouble with the British consul in Bilbao, boarded a ship, and after three and a half weeks got Buenos Aires. Officials in Argentina believed at first I was a German spy and it took some doings to convince them it was not so. Bernard settled in Argentina, married and had four children, one of whom's on this call, Alex, two of whom now live in Germany, one lives in Sydney and Alex is in Chicago. And Bernard died in 2017. And I think it's, there's a strong clue that his, his father, Carl, living in Argentina, was obviously the, the main uh, cause or the main person who was enabled um, Bernard to leave. The life of Carl's other son, Klaus, will surprise you in a different way. Bernard writes, he was supposed to go to Argentina, but insisted on finishing his secondary school, which he did under great difficulties in Mainz. In the meantime, war broke out and Germany closed its borders and Klaus had great difficulty to escape persecution, finally went underground until the Americans liberated Mainz in 1945. My mother was also bombed out twice and the second time she almost lost her life. Now I mentioned earlier that Karl's wife was Catholic. Klaus grew up in the Catholic faith. He entered the priesthood and became the parish priest of Stephans in Mainz, St. Stephans. 
1973, he approached Marc Chagall, the famous Russian painter, to design stained glass windows for the apse of the church. And these were finished during Easter week 1979 with 91-year-old Marc Chagall executing the final detailed painting. There are many windows like this in the church now. The city's website says 200,000 visitors a year visit the church. Tourists from the whole world pilgrim up St. Stephen's Mount to see the glowing blue stained glass windows by Marc Chagall. It's the only German, German church for which Chagall created windows. At age 97, Father Klaus Meyer still lives in Mainz. And what about their sister, Liesel? Bernard's only daughter had a wartime experience that was like Anne Frank's, but with a happy ending. On Kristallnacht, her husband, Hans Gebhardt, a wine merchant, was visiting clients in Holland. Liesel spoke to him by phone and advised him not to return to Germany. At that time, Hans and Liesel had two children, Anne, aged 12, and Oliver, aged eight. Two months after Kristallnacht, in January 1939, Liesel put them on the kinder transport to England, seeing them for the last time until 1946. Oliver wrote, I'll never forget how my mother and grandmother Gebhardt took us to the Mainz, Mainz station and put us on the kinder transport train. I never saw my grandmother again. She died in Theresienstadt concentration camp. Oliver recently recounted this experience to the BBC, and I'm going to play a little extract of it, which I hope you can hear. Hello, and thank you for downloading Witness from the BBC World Service. And today we're taking you back to January 1939, and in Mainz, in Germany, an eight-year-old boy called Oliver Gebhardt is getting ready for a long journey without his parents. He's to join one of the kinder transport trains carrying Jewish children out of Nazi Europe to Britain. He's been speaking to Nina Robinson. Well, this is such a traumatic experience that you will never forget it. Now 80 years old, Oliver Gebhardt clearly remembers being a boy of eight at the train station, saying goodbye without tears to his mother and grandmother. It was for a child extremely important that the mother didn't cry. If the mother had broken down, that would have been terrible for the children. The mother was strong. I couldn't have faced it. I just couldn't have faced it. Because the other children, they, they couldn't leave their parents. They just let the train go by. Ten thousand children did get on the trains over the course of nine months. The journeys were given the green light by British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain after it became clear that perhaps the only hope for Jewish children in Germany was evacuation. The event which led to this realization? Kristallnacht, yes, it's also called the Reichspogromnacht. Yeah. Name the night of broken glass. There was a wave of violence against Jews in Germany and Austria. Plainclothes SS troopers raided shops and destroyed thousands of homes and synagogues. So <clears throat> if you want to hear the whole thing, just Google BBC Witness, Oliver's story, and you can listen to Oliver tell the full story. After Liesel's children were placed on kinder transport, she was able to leave Germany and join her husband in Holland where they hoped to get visas to join their children in England. The visas never came, but the Nazis did. Hello, and thank you. But luckily for them, a truly Christian employee of Hans Gebhardt, uh, Mr. Van Koik, undertook to hide them. And for over two and a half years, from September 1942 until May 1945, they remain, re remained hidden in near starvation conditions remaining quiet at night when the Van Gogh's children were home and only coming out during the day when they were at school. This the Van Gogh's did at great risk to their lives and this sacrifice is recognized in Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial. Meanwhile, Anne and Oliver, after arriving on kinder transport in England, were farmed out to various families who would take in children for small payments 
from the Jewish refugee organizations. Anne recount, recounts how they were of a rough background and when her aunt Elizabeth, my grandmother, heard of the conditions, she collected them and placed them with relatives. By war's end, Anne was training as a children's nurse and it was only in the spring of 1946, a year later, that she was able to travel to Holland to be re re reunited with her parents. Hans and Liesel lived the rest of their lives in Holland, as has Oliver, now aged 90. While Anna emigrated to Canada, married and is now aged 93, lives in Toronto, and we visit quite often. So you've heard of Bernard's three eldest, Carl, Ernst and Liesel, and Carl's sons, Bernard and Klaus. The fourth child, Martin, was born 14 years after his sister. At age 24, was working in the family jewelry business in Portside. It was there that Martin met his wife, Clarel, and in 1937, they had their first child, Yvonne. The business was confiscated by the Nazis in 1938, but Martin was kept on as a salesman. And he was on a business trip to Holland on Kristallnacht. He recounted in a recording with his grandson, on a business trip to Holland, I wanted to go back on the 9th of November and going through customs, I was spoken to by our forwarding agent. Surely you're not going back today. They're taking all Jews off the trains when they arrive in Germany. Don't go back. So I decided not to. I knew my brother-in-law Hans was also on a business trip in Holland. I went back to The Hague and joined him there. We spoke to Germany and they told us on the phone. We should not come back. About six weeks after Kristallnacht, Hans, who was over 60, got permission to stay in Holland. But as I was so young, I did not, and was expelled from Holland and allowed to go to England as a visitor. Now Martin's wife, Claire, was still in Germany and could get a visa to go to England as a domestic servant, but not one for her daughter. So she left the daughter in the care of her sister who'd escaped to France. They met at the border, handed over two-year-old Yvonne in the hope of gaining a visa for her once she arrived in England. Just imagine that, handing over your two-year-old firstborn, not knowing when you'd see her again. And the outbreak of war intervened and they were separated for the duration. Now Martin carries on. After war broke out, I had to appear in front of a tribunal to be classified. And I came before an old judge, well in his 80s, I should imagine, and he said, I'm absolutely disgusted that a young German wants to fight against Germany. He obviously had no idea of the difference between refugee and non-refugee. Now, Martin, like my father's experience, in May 1940, was also interned. Here's, what, here's his, his story about that. Two policemen came, took me away in a taxi, took me to my lodgings where I was to pack a case, and then we took me to the headquarters of the army in Birmingham. I was then taken handcuffed by a sergeant and a guard in, to Liverpool, and then to the internment camp of Heighton, which was a housing estate in a suburb of Liverpool. And the first person I met in Heighton was the former Orthodox rabbi of Mainz, Rabbi Bamberger. Once or twice, I was supposed to go on transports to Canada and to Australia. But as I was in the company office, I knew when the transport would go off and I was on the lists for them. But when they assembled the transports, I hid in the loft of the house where I lived. When the transports had left, I reappeared again. So Martin managed to stay in England and was released from internment in November, 1940. At the same time, his wife was given a visa to the USA. But Martin wanted to stay in the UK and join the army. And of course, they were closer to, to their daughter in France if they stayed in England. They had a son, Peter, in 1943. But before there could be a happy ending, Martin had to recover their daughter from a hiding place in France. As an Allied soldier in the Royal Engineers, he followed the invasion in late 1944, in June 1944, stationed in Bayeux. He describes it as follows. In September 1944, after the liberation of Paris, I went to a French liaison officer I went with a French liaison office to find them. They were living under a different name. But when inquiring with a concierge at the address I had been given, by a wonderful stroke of luck, my wife's sister heard my voice, came out, and we were reunited. 
So Martin could confirm that his daughter had survived the war, but he was still on active duty. It took until May 1945 when he could go back to Paris, collect Yvonne, and he says, as there was no civilian transport, I took her over in a troop ship, and she was the only female amongst thousands of soldiers and seamen. Incidentally, their daughter Yvonne's real name is Ursula, but when she was in hiding, part of the time was in a Catholic convent. There, the nuns thought Ursula was too German a name, so they called her Yvonne, and that name has stuck with her for the rest of her life. Finally, Martin searched for his sister Liesel and her husband still in Holland. He says, I got a message they were safe and address where they were staying. So it must have been the beginning of June. I went to Bilthoven and found them and they lived for 32 months in hiding and were only about 99 pounds each in weight, but comparatively well. And through me, they could get in touch with their children, Anne and Oliver in England. I was then posted to Germany in June 1945 and stayed there until I was dubbed, demobbed in June 46. Martin and Claire lived in the Birmingham for the rest of their lives. Martin establishing a business in the silverware industry. Daughter Yvonne now lives in London, aged 82, and son Peter in Birmingham. And so ends my story of the diaspora of this branch of the Myers. Frida and Bernard, six children, seven spouses, 11 grandchildren, 26 in all. By May 1945, they'd survived the death and destruction of the war and were scattered on three continents. And their descendants continue to move around the world today and now live in USA, Argentina, Germany, England, Australia, and Canada. So if any of you would like more family photos or stories or would like the text of this, this talk, let me know, there's my email address. And now I will stop sharing. I, I would like to open it up to, to questions from the audience, but I also, before I open it up, I wanna thank you, Dave. Um, like I had said before in the introduction, I knew a bit of your family story uh, through the, the Rotary presentation, and it's what sparked this idea for, for a, a workshop for Hamilton Jewish Family Services. But when I'm listening to this story, and it's an amazing family story that, that spans, like you say, continents and uh, experiences. It is, I, I am really just, I feel very thankful that you were able to share this story with us. It is, it's an incredible story. Um, and it's a story of resilience and courage and, and also the destruction of, of European jewelry as well, which is a, a very, it's horrific. So it, you know, I want to open it up to the audience. And again, Dave, thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you. Uh, can I just say, to any of my newly found relatives on the call, I'd love if you'd stay at the end and introduce yourselves. <laughs> Go ahead. If, no question. I actually, you know what, Dave, I'm gonna ask you a question because I'm wondering about this, is about um, what your father or, or what some of the, um, or, or just even some of the relations that were, um, the, the, the Catholic faith kind of became involved. What was their relationship with Judaism after the war? And was it something that was was talked about or was it hidden or, I mean, and I know you have relatives on the line here too, but you know, it, it's especially coming from that reform German, very secular perspective. Talk to me a little bit about that and how it maybe influenced you as a person. It, it didn't really influence me a lot because my mother was Roman Catholic mm -hmm. uh, and my father and many of his family were not um, were not practicing in the faith, as far mm -hmm. as I understand. So there wasn't a strong, um, for some of them, there wasn't a strong link to the Jewish faith. For others, obviously, Bernard, uh, who, who was the president of the synagogue, there clearly was. Um, but um, his son, um, Carl, married a Roman Catholic. And I believe his children were brought up Roman Catholic. Alejandro, your father, was he, he was brought up Roman Catholic too? Oh, he has to unmute himself. Uh, okay. Unmute. Yes, uh, uh, first, I wanted to thank you, David, for a wonderful presentation. I mean, <laughs> I learned a lot about the family. Um, yes, uh, my grandmother was Catholic, so my father and 
Klaus, who still lives, he's gonna be 98 now in February. He lives in Mainz. Uh, they were both educated at Etal in, in South Bayern, you know, Babi, uh, it's a very famous um, school. Uh, so they both studied there and um, Klaus became actually, uh, did his seminar there. Um, and so we were, we were raised as Catholics in Argentina, but uh, we knew about the fact that our, uh, our family was Jewish because my grandfather would tell us stories about our great grandparents who died in Buenos Aires, as you mentioned, in the late 40s. Um, so we were aware of that. And as I was telling you earlier, when, before we started, I have all these old photo albums that I inherited from my father. And actually there are many pictures I'm gonna send Stephanie and Alex at some point, to the <laughs> family, um, which I didn't know existed, but my father had kept them. So my great grandparents brought all of this in this, in this boat trip that you mentioned from Portugal to Buenos Aires in the, they were able to leave Germany. I think it was 1941 with the help of my grandfather. So yeah, it was, um, this is what I can tell you about the Jewish and Catholic connection in, in my branch of the family. So other members of the family um, took different paths. My grandmother actually, um, my grandmother um, converted to the Catholic faith, um, but her daughter, Susanna, um, has returned to the Jewish faith. So I, it, it's just an interesting, there are a lot of interesting differences. Mm. I, I can speak to what happened in my family and, and maybe my my brother, Alex, who's also on, he might not to be confused with Alejandro, <laughs> 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 might also, I, I don't know if he has a different perspective, but before I say what I was gonna say, I just wanna echo what Alejandro said and thank you so much, Dave. I, I I'm just overwhelmed and I really also appreciated the family trees because I have so much trouble keeping them all straight. So thank you for that. Um, but my grandparents, Ernst and Irmgard, so I, I don't really have any memories of Ernst because as Dave said, he died in 1964. Um, but my grandmother, um, I, I really wish I had asked her more questions. I did try to talk to her some she did not want to talk about what happened to her in Germany. I do know she never had a, well, I don't believe she ever had a menorah. We didn't find one after she died in um, 1994, going through all of her personal possessions. I never saw one in her apartment. She did always have a Christmas tree, a little Christmas tree. She had some very old wooden German ornaments. I assume they were from Germany, I don't know for sure. But my father, um, Stefan or Steven, as they changed his name to when he came to the United States, he retained a very strong Jewish identity. My family is secular, um, but I believe that through both my mother and my father, we, we retain a very strong sense of Jewish identity and our history is very important. And Dave has really <laughs> enhanced our knowledge of the history through, with this wonderful talk. Um, and so um, I, I guess in conclusion, I would say that the, I feel like my grandmother, Irmgard, denied her Jewishness. Um, but I'm guessing that in her heart, it was still there. It's powerful. I think it's powerful. And I, I you know, I, working at a Jewish family services, there are a lot of people that, that come to our agency that say, you know, I am, I am maybe religiously nothing but culturally Jewish, or I have a Jewish ancestor, can I still use your services? And absolutely, you're part of, 
of the Jewish family. And I think that some of the work Federation's really done is saying that intermarriage is happening um, and we need to be more, we need to be embrace kind of the, the, the whole range of, of Jewishness that exists um, in the world. I, I have another question, Dave, because I think this is a really interesting connection. You found out through your research, you had a relative in Hamilton, did you not? Yes. Well, it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't my research quite. It was my, um, my aunt Susanna's research. She went to the um, four, 50th anniversary of the liberation of Buchenwald in 1995. 94 and 95. And she met someone with the same surname as her father, Karl Bach. And she said, are we, are we related? And, and he said, no, we're not related, but you might want to write Professor Karl Bach at Sutton, Sussex University because he might be related to you. And my aunt got a letter back from Professor Karl Bach's wife said, no, nope, we're not related. But I had this letter five years ago from a lady called Ruth Goldberg in Hamilton. And she was looking for, for Peter Kaulbach because he appears on a family tree that she has. And so I then call Ruth Goldberg in Hamilton, whose husband Yakov is on this call, whose daughter uh, is on this call, whose granddaughter is on this call. <laughs> um, and she said, yes, your cousin, Gavin, who's also on this call, lives in Mississauga, go meet him. And so we've become the best of friends, uh, go on trips together, celebrate, well, Gavin comes to us for Christmas and we go to him for, for Passover Sunday. <laughs> so it's, been, it's, it's actually been a fantastic experience to suddenly acquire a whole new family 50 years after the war. Magnificent, yeah. That is, that really is, it's, um, it, that is, it is phenomenal. Um, so is any, are there any other questions? I, I will I will say also that there are some really good books about that number 10 commando unit in the, the British Army, it's no, the number three troop, uh, the Jewish troop it was called. I'd say check out those books. It's, it's I know I looked it up. Dave's dad is actually mentioned in the book. So we had a conversation about this. I have recorded this um, presentation too. So if you'd like a copy, just send me an email. I think we're going to hopefully put it up on the JFS website. Um, and I just really, again, thank everyone for attending and Dave for sharing this truly incredible story. I'm looking at the, the comments that have been coming into me, but also that are listed here. It's a very powerful story. And, you know, I, I said to you, Dave, when, when I was, um, when you, we were talking about it is in Judaism, they say like, may, may their memory be a blessing. And I think, I think your ancestors' memory is a, is a blessing and you, you were delivering on that blessing by sharing this with us. So thank you. Thank you. If, if I may say something to David and Nicholas that I see here, who was my father's godson. Um, I remember your father, Andrew, and your mother very well, because in 2001, I went to a meeting in Edinburgh, and they were so kind to invite me to their home. Um, I can't remember the name of the town, but I remember taking a train to their home by the, by the sea. Mm. And uh, we, we, we talked about the family and about your grandmother, Elizabeth, who I met when I was 20 years old in Reading. I think she lived Correct. in Reading. Correct. And so, and that I also met Martin, uh, you know, the brother of my, my grandfather and Ernst, Ernst's youngest brother as well. So thank you for this wonderful presentation, bring back all these memories. I, I hope that this might kick off a, um, a continued sharing of the information that we have because uh, just as I said, some of the pictures I showed you today, I only received today. So I had to go hunting and, and writing to people saying, have you got pictures from the twenties and thirties of your grandparents? Uh, can you tell me any more about what happened to them? And uh, so I, you know, I continue to want to build this story so we can pass it on to our kids. I know that youngsters don't, aren't very interested in this stuff, but when you get to my age, it becomes very interesting and you want to pass it on. Make sure your kids know the stories. I think it's really important. I think our, our ancestor stories make us who we are in the present too. We are, we are, we are their legacy. So I, I think 
it, it is really incredible. And, and the rest of you, there is the Jewish Genealogy Society that meets at the temple regularly. Check it out. If you have any genealogy questions too, I would say reach out to Dave. He is, he is phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just thank you for showing, showing up for this. And a, a last memory I'd like to share. The first time I met you, David, was in 1994 in Toronto at oh, yeah. home when Alan you still lived and uh, I was coming from a meeting in Montreal and you had this very big roll that you extended on the carpet with all the family tree <laughs> that extended several meters, I remember, you know? So <laughs> you've been in really very active in genealogy over the decades since I know you. <clears throat> I, I do have quite a bit of stuff here, yes. <laughs> I think family reunion in Toronto in 2020, I don't know what. <laughs> that sounds great. Great. It's COVID. Yeah. Okay. Um, Stephanie, would you stay on and introduce me to your family? Because I, I think there's some of them on this call. I'd Peter? love to. Yeah. Let's Peter? see. Yeah. I, are they? Yeah. Peter's there. Peter seems to be.